I'm so excited to talk to you because I truly love your films. Oh, uh, thank you. One of the things that strikes me about your films are in terms of the the figures that you choose to explore they're very conflicted and uh conflicting i mean they're they're challenging <laughs> for an audience they don't quite know how to feel about them it, it, is that a fair assessment I think so. I think that there are people. That, I think that's right. I think there are people who people have um, misperceptions about or judgments about, um, and uh, that they can, you know, be. Uh, yeah, I think that there are people who are generally, as, uh, as Nina Simone did, says so beautifully in the cover, are you know often misunderstood. Mm-hmm. And when you set out to investigate their lives, I mean, you personally must come to a certain understanding of them. So I'm I'm curious as a documentarian if there's ever a challenge in not necessarily imposing your own personal opinions about these people but letting the material kind of speak for itself. Sure. I mean, I think in in the Nina Simone film our goal was to have as much of Nina's voice in her writing and her music and her um footage of her and again you know especially her audio um form the the narrative spine of the film but i think it's probably fair to say that you know in all documentaries we are imposing our point of view on it you know you have a world of material to choose from and you're choosing you know 90 or 100 minutes of material and you're putting things next to other things and all of those things form the meaning of your movie so you know those meanings are always influenced by the filmmaker um, in any case and you know i think it's even the same for for journalism but you you know we're storytellers, and I like to say, like, if you're in an art class, and um, you know there's a there's a model in the middle of the room, and you know there are people doing paintings of that model, all the paintings are going to have very different looks and feels to them. You know, Picasso might make it into an abstract painting. Somebody else might make mm-hmm. it highly realistic. So, you know, we're, you know, you know, other filmmakers would make a different film without Nina Simone. And yes, this is my, an interpretation of her, but in, in her case, you know, it was important to me to have her voice dominate uh, the story as much as possible. Well, I wasn't aware of her story at all uh, prior to seeing your movie. I'm I'm not the coolest cat on the planet when it comes to music, uh, but uh, and so it was so riveting to me to see her life unfold. What was the 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 germ of your interest in her story? Um, yeah, well, I didn't know. I think no one really knew the full extent of her life story um, at all. Before, you know, until. Recently, um, so I don't think it has to do with being a cool cat or not. I think it has to do with people also being very protective of her while she was still, you know, performing on stage, and um, you know, and also the way society has changed and the way we talk about mental health um, and mental illness and um, and the way that we interpret um, those symptoms, you know, nowadays as opposed to 40 years ago. Um, I mean, we still have a long ways to go, but I think there's more understanding, of course, and more ability to treat. Um, For me, I was invited to pitch myself as a director for this film. Um, Radical Media approached me, and, um, uh, you know, I was always a huge fan of Nina's music, but, like, you didn't know that life story. So I started to dig in a little bit, and once I did, I realized that there was, you know, an incredible film here to be made, and... um, a lot about Nina that not only was it known about her, but that is was politically um, extremely resonant today, and also from the point of view of an artist that you know I, I really believe she's one of the great artists of the 20th century, and she really hadn't properly had her due. So the so the uh, surviving the members of the family and the people that were close to her, they were finally ready to to engage in in a documentary about her life. So they were very willing participants. Well, I think some were more willing than others, you know, as often in the case of um, in documentaries, you have to spend, you know, a good amount of time and energy um, talking to people and allowing them to get to know you a little bit so they trust you, too. Um, And I think that, you know, in talking about someone who is very special to them and also very complicated, um, you know, there's a reason to feel wary because um, she, you know, you could certainly portray Nina in unflattering lights if if you choose to. But I think ultimately over over time, there was a feeling that, you know, I loved and respected Nina um, and that, you know, they decided to kind of take that leap of faith with us. Yeah. 
Well, this is something that, I mean, it's a question, and, and, and mental illness kind of runs through a few of your films as well. Uh, I mean, most prominently in something like Bobby Fischer. And mm-hmm. I guess the main, the main, one of the main questions that comes to mind with, with Bobby Fischer and Against the World, I mean, is the line between uh, genius and, you know, for lack of a better term, madness, which is something that we even see in narrative films like uh, something like Amadeus or something. Uh, mm-hmm. But w- w- is is that a point of in- interest for you uh, to explore? Oh, yeah. Certainly, I think you know those of us, those people who fall outside the box um, uh, of behaviors, and you know who are extremely sensitive, and um, uh, often are uh, you know sometimes judged as you know using unfair terms like crazy, et cetera. But I also think you know the idea of the child prodigy, which both you know Nina and Bobby Fischer were. You kind of you grow up in this isolated you know, box. And I think it's very difficult. You know, people don't socialize with you normally and you don't socialize with them normally and you're working all this amount of time. So I think that's something that, you know, runs through both of them is that their childhoods are really rarefied as that child prodigy. And certainly I think that, you know, certainly people can survive that, but it's tough. Yeah, yeah. And also the, the one of the other factors that so impresses me about Nina Simone, your film, um the whenever you see musical biopics for instance one major shortcoming of most of them is that you don't really get a sense of where their art comes from mm-hmm. and I, I watching your film i i really got a sense of who she was i mean a, a, on a deep level and mm. her art was sim- was an extension of that I, I mean that had to have been an important point for you to get across Sure, and I think also one of the things is, you know, you really want to hear the music. I mean, I think Nina poured so much of herself in the music, which is why, you know, that's such a strong feeling. You know, every cover, you know, of a song that she did, she made it totally her own. And um, you felt so much of herself and her own um, emotional journey, her pain, her joy, her anger um, in in those songs. Um, So certainly allowing them to kind of play out is a way of understanding Nina more deeply. Um, You know, we came to understand the film at a certain point in the editing room as a musical um, in that, um, you know, every song had a narrative function. Um, Every song could help advance the story and help us understand Nina more deeply. They weren't just examples. Oh, here's Exhibit A of art. Um, so I think that that was, you know, a big part of it. Did the did that music kind of guide the choices that you made in the editing room? Uh, yes. I mean, I, sometimes we chose music because of its narrative uh, meaning, you know, like Don't Smoke in Bed is a film about, you know, when, when she leaves her husband. Um, and sometimes we chose film because of songs because, of course, they, they marked a certain uh, chronological pr- progression or change turning point in her career, like a Mississippi Goddamn. Um, mm-hmm. But oftentimes, you know, we use songs for storytelling pur- purposes. You know, we, we use the song I Love You Porgy when she meets her first husband. You know, no, it's not actually her first husband, but her, the major love of her life, her, her uh, husband, Andy Stroud. So, yes, certainly the songs were meant to uh, both advance the story and, uh, and you know, allow you to experience the artistic nature, um, her the experimentation, the infusion of classical, um, her classical training in these pieces, and of course the extraordinary uh, range of her voice. I have a, a couple of questions, or, or one major question about putting together a documentary. Is there a moment in the process in which you always know? Okay, yes, there's a film there. A, a moment where the kind of the film tells you what it wants to be, and uh, added on to that, how do you know when you have enough? When you're done? Well, hopefully, before I start a film, I know if I have a film there. I mean, I look. You know, I all, people will suggest films to me, and you know, I'll look at them in, with incredibly critical. Um, eyes before I would, you know, sign on to anything. You know, is this just going to be a talking head story with lots of people just kind of talking, or is there real um, kind of, uh, you know, great footage or, um, 
emotional and social issue heft, you know, like what are the th- kind of things that make a film worthy of, of making in the first place, right? Um, mm-hmm. And so that's the first thing. Um, but when do I know when I stop? You don't always know when you want to stop. I mean, all, most of us, many of us in my field, will will be editing um, and we'll still be shooting, you know, and, you know, we'll be in the edit room and we'll think, oh, we really need to go out and you know, speak to this person. So I think that um, I think that the process, you know, it's kind of ongoing. Um, and when do you want to stop in the edit room? Is like when you just, you know, finally watch a cut of your film that you you don't feel like pulling your hair out <laughs> during. I mean, that you feel like, okay, this is done. I have nothing to apologize for, nothing to explain. You know, and that's and that's you know the feeling at the end. But I've heard some, and I, I don't know if you feel the same way or not. I've heard some narrative filmmakers say that, you know, a, a film is not necessarily completed as much as it's abandoned. I mean, there's just a point in time where, where you just say, well, that's it's that's it. I mean, it's gotta it's gotta go out in the world sometime. True, although I wouldn't put it out in the world if I didn't feel that it was ready right. to go out in the world. And like you know, like a child, I'm not going to send them out, you know, half dressed or with toothpaste on their face, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to send the film out when I feel like it needs TLC. Oh, I understand that. But it, when when yeah. you look back when you look back through your films, I, I mean, do you, do you feel an element of yeah, that that was told as as well as I I possibly could have or is there always kind of an unfinished you know, how, what is your reaction when you look back through your own work? I mean, oftentimes if I haven't, if it's been a little while and I'm sitting in a room screening a film, you know, with an audience, I'll say, ooh, I should have trimmed that right there. Um, Or, oh, I wonder why I didn't find that still and put that right there. But it's not, but that's usually all it is. It's not like some major misgiving. Because, again, I don't put things out until I feel like they're ready to go out. Right. But something like Marilyn Marilyn Monroe with with your Love, Marilyn film, I mean, this is... Mm -hmm. Much like Nina Simone, uh, to to a large extent, you're you're having the subject themselves tell their own story, mm-hmm. uh, and, and you know there's been so much uh, produced about Marilyn Monroe over the years because she's one of our legendary iconic figures. W- w- was that the key to to turning you on to to exploring her life? The fact that you had these diary entries. Yeah, I mean, when I look, I was was no Marilyn Monroe fanatic. I mean, there are those people who sort of follow her every moment and knew every photograph and photographer. You know, I was... um I, I, but when I looked at the letters that she wrote, um, I suddenly found a woman that I could relate to, and that was very surprising to me. Um, And uh, that was the film that I wanted to make. I hadn't seen that before. Yeah. And what was the process for you in... Because this is something that rarely happens in documentaries, unless it's possibly something like a voiceover or a narration. Mm. But mm-hmm. in, in directing actors, well, you know, I'd done some I'd done some short narrative films before, um, and so for me, it was something that I was comfortable with and um, that I actually really enjoy. Uh, and um, in some ways, it shares a great. Um, there's a great deal in common with that and with um, working with your documentary subjects because really what you're trying to do is make them comfortable to do their best um, and to make them understand the context of what it is that you're looking for in some ways that and allow them the most positive environment to do what they can do. Um, so that is a similar feeling. Of course, with documentary subjects, they they'll you know they they're going to go off script and surprise you and you know what you might uh, not know exactly what you're going to get. But in terms of creating that environment of positivity and enabling someone to kind of do their best, that's a similar feeling and trait. Yeah. And you know, obviously, I mean, such accomplished actresses, that, uh, actors that you had in Love, Marilyn. So their, uh, I mean, their their unique gift is they they can very they can be truthful on camera. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But with the subjects, like something like there, there's something wrong with Aunt Diane, which is I'm crazy about that film. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, they're not necessarily used to being on camera. So I would imagine there has to be some process of establishing a comfort zone with them. 
Sure, and that's actually the same because you know, though actors are are pros, many of you know many of them show up on set with a tremendous amount of anxiety. Look at Marilyn Monroe. I mean, she was nearly you know petrified to come out of her trailer and would be four hours late because the anxiety was out. So I think working with actors can. I mean, there of course there are some who just show up and can kind of be right on point, but um, in general, there's a lot of kind of. Um, uh, you know, comfort building and confidence building between director and actor and director and subject. So in the case of something like, you know, there's something wrong with Diane, Diane, it was about creating a situation where they were comfortable and they felt trust and they felt that, you know, what they did would be used in a way that uh, would be comfortable for them. And I think, you know, I think that's there's a parallel there. A big part of the reason why I, I think that your Aunt Diane film is so extraordinary is because it speaks to this phenomenon of just so desperately wanting to know the mm. potentially unknowable yeah. and just the yeah. frustration of that. When you set out to make this movie, I mean, did did you set out ultimately to to find a definitive answer? It was such a perplexing case so tragic um i told hbo very early on i said i don't think there's going to be a smoking gun here guys you know that that you know there's there have been numerous agencies that have gone through this case um there's no reason to suspect um malevolence or uh even neglect on the case of the the police departments that were responsible for the case. I mean, so many children's lives were lost. I mean, I, I, we do believe that they took the case very seriously. So early on, I sort of, I understood, I, you know, I was, I, my expectations were that there was not going to be some here is the smoking gun, the one answer that, that we could provide. What we did know, though, was that in families we all – keep secrets, and um, that there are ways in which, you know, we all exist, especially when substances are involved with certain amounts of denial that, that can kind of protect us, but also can, of course, as you, we can see, hurt us. So yeah. um, in this case, we I think we were able to peel back the layers on those dynamics as opposed to one single smoking gun. And usually in life, <laughs> there is no one single smoking gun. It is mm. layers upon layers of dynamics and and dysfunction that can cause uh, families to become hurt. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's certainly what we, you know, what we were able to explore there. And I don't think it's unique to that family. I think we find it in, in all of our cases. I mean, you know, families that struggle with when a child has taken their own life, when they're suicide. You know, so many people go through that. We're always looking for that one answer, that why. But, of course, it's multiple, multiple layers of things that, that go into these things, and there's never that one answer. Yeah. Have you fallen in love with a new subject yet for mm. your next film? No, I'm still in love with my old subject. <laughs> I've still really been, you know, I've just been, you know, with Nina, we, you know, I've been, it's been a year of kind of being on tour with this film and uh, it's still very, very close to me and I'm still doing it. So um, soon I think I'll have the space in my heart and my head to, to figure out what that next thing is yet. All right. You know yeah, that's yeah. that's that's something that's not uh, brought to light enough because you you're so invested in in these people for years, and you hear yeah. it sometimes on, uh, for narrative films like you're you're close knit for six months on a set and then you never see each other again and there's a period of mourning. I mean, you have to feel that after a project too. Oh, yes, and it's not just the set, because our sets are, of course, so much smaller, so it's not that, you know, and usually they're more intermittent, you know, we shoot for four or five days, and then we take, you know, um, but it's it's the subject, you know, it's the Nina, it's Nina Simone, who I feel so close to, and even though I never was in the same physical space as her when she was alive, um, and her family, and the people who lived around her, you become part of their family, um, and so then, and yes, in that way, there is that withdrawal, so Certainly since I've been out with this film all year, people say, you know, so what's next? What's next? And honest, I have to, you know, you do have to kind of fall in love again. And in order to fall mm -hmm. in love again, you know, you have to, you know, you have to be over the last love. Um, and not that you fully get over it, but you have to have the space in your heart and in your head for that. Yeah. And so it, it, my last question for you, uh, if you were to teach a uh, cl class on documentary filmmaking. Are there mm. a a examples of other people's works or particular films that you would choose to illustrate various lessons? Oh, sure. I mean, certain kind of hero films of mine, um, Harlan County, USA by Barbara Koppel. Oh, yeah. 
um, uh, Thin Blue Line by Earl Morris, um, uh, Gimme Shelter um, by the Maisels, you know, one of my all-time, the all-time greats. Uh, yes. I'd say those are three of my, my favorite films, yeah. You know, Gimme give, give Shelter is so extraordinary because I, I'm sure that they set out to capture the, the Stones on tour, so that would, would have been one film. But obviously exactly. the film kind of kind of redefined itself in the process of making it. And so as uh, the end result is some kind of, like one of the most suspenseful, the suspense of dread almost that permeates that film. It, right. It, that has, that it has starts to with a murder a, and then goes back, and it's an extraordinary process, like a journey. Right, exactly. It could have just been a concert film. Um, which is so, which amazing. is so unique, which is so unique to documentary filmmaking in a large extent, because you're, the the film is constantly kind of redefining itself, and you have to kind of recalibrate, I would think, during that entire process. That's right, right. It starts off as one thing, and it becomes a, a thriller, you know, or something else. Like, and, and that doesn't happen in narrative filmmaking. That you have to kind of uh, keep that open mind and heart to to allow you to see where the best story is. 